Welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's event, Medicaid in the U.S. Territories and how inequitable funding exacerbates health disparities. I'm Carter Steger, Vice President of State and Local Campaigns at the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, or as we refer to it, ACS CAN. As the advocate affiliate of the American Cancer Society, we share ACS's mission of pursuing a world free from cancer. Achieving health equity is the cornerstone of our work, and we cannot achieve our mission without addressing the inequities that exist. Much of ACS CAN's health equity work centers on protecting and expanding access to health care for all communities. We know that cancer impacts everyone, but it does not impact everyone equally. We are working to ensure everyone has a fair and just opportunity to prevent, find, treat, and survive cancer. No one should be disadvantaged in their fight against cancer because of how much money they make, the color of their skin, the sex their sexual orientation, their gender identity, their disability status, or where they live. And that is where Medicaid plays a critical role. Medicaid, which is a health insurance program for low-income families, is a lifeline for cancer patients, survivors, and those at risk for the disease. We have an urgent need to help cancer patients, survivors, and those at risk for cancer obtain the health care they depend on and expanding access to elig and eligibility for Medicaid is a key step toward that goal. In, 19, in, excuse me, in 2019, we launched an educational project called Medicaid Covers Us to share stories and resources about the importance of Medicaid. It is so important that people understand how increased access to healthcare coverage through Medicaid can positively impact families, communities, healthcare systems, and the economy. And last year, we launched a webinar series about Medicaid and health equity. Today's webinar is the fourth webinar in this series. I'm really excited to have so many of you join us for this important conversation. And to start things off, I'd like to introduce Hillary G. Geckner, Senior Campaign Manager on the state and local campaign team. Thanks, Carter. For individuals facing a cancer diagnosis without other access to quality, affordable health coverage, insurance through Medicaid can be the difference between life and death. Research shows individuals without access to health insurance are more likely than those with insurance to be diagnosed with cancer at a later stage when the disease is more costly to treat and survival is less likely. Residents of the U.S. territories of Guam, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Northern Mariana Islands, American Samoa, and Puerto Rico are U.S. citizens, but these entities are treated very differently from the states and the District of Columbia when it comes to Medicaid as well as a host of other issues. In the states and DC, the federal government matches all Medicaid expenditures at the Federal Matching Assistance Percentage or FMAP, which is calculated and adjusted annually based on the state's per capita income. The lower the per capita income, the higher the need for Medicaid and therefore the higher the matching rate. This matching rate ranges from 55 to 83%. States draw down federal funds at the, this rate as needed with no limit which allows Medicaid to provide crucial health coverage for low-income individuals when they need it. In the U.S. territories, Medicaid spending is capped or block granted. The federal matching rate is set at the lowest level of 55% and does not account for territories per capita income. While Congress has appropriated additional funds on top of base level funding in recent years and temporarily increased matching rates, the amount of funding available varies and is unpredictable. And even with supplemental funding, Medicaid in the US territories has never been funded at levels comparable to the states. This funding does not come close to covering the costs of the healthcare needs that Medicaid enrollees have or the number of residents who need health coverage through Medicaid. And at times, territories have been unable to draw down their block grants because they didn't have the necessary matching funds. Fortunately, in recent years, Congress has appropriated additional funds on top of the base level funding and temporarily increased matching rates, but these changes are not enough to solve the territory's funding challenges and are not a permanent solution. Temporary increases and in stopgap funding lead to fiscal cliffs for these programs, meaning each new, as each new deadline approaches, 
the Medicaid programs do not know whether their federal funding will drastically decline if Congress does not act. We are approaching one of these deadlines today, though a continuing resolution is expected to pass before midnight tonight in order to maintain current funding levels through early December, temporarily delaying the cliff once more. Amongst all this funding uncertainty, Medicaid programs in the territories are dealing with significant health disparities and the challenges that accompany natural disasters. Poverty rates in the territories range from 22% in Guam and the US Virgin Islands to 43% in Puerto Rico to more than 50% in American Samoa and the Northern Mariana Islands. These rates are much higher than those of the states. Nationally, 10.5% of US residents live below the federal poverty level with the highest rates in Louisiana and Mississippi at 19%, lower than any of the territories. Studies have shown that cervical cancer incidence in Guam is nearly double the rate of Hawaii, and compared with men in Hawaii, men in Guam, particularly Chamorros, are disproportionately affected by poor health out outcomes for a number of cancers. Just under half of adults in the U.S. Virgin Islands report having had a colonoscopy, a routine screening that can prevent cancer from ever developing, compared with nearly two thirds of adults across the US. And rates of diabetes in all of the territories are higher than the average for the states, with Puerto Rico reporting the highest rate of diabetes for any state or territory. So Medicaid has a large role to play as there are significant health challenges to address. We're excited to bring you the stories of several patients, healthcare providers and territorial leaders in Guam, the US Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. In a moment, you'll hear from Medicaid enrollees Jorge Rodriguez and Mabel Nieves from Puerto Rico, as well as Nieves Herrera and Patsy Daniel from the US Virgin Islands. Guam Governor Lou Leon Guerrero, Health Commissioner for the US Virgin Islands, Justa Encarnacion, Puerto Rico's Medicaid Director Edna Marin, Tina Comision, Chief Compliance Officer and Legal Counsel for Schneider Regional Medical Center and the Charlotte Kimmelman Cancer Institute in the Virgin Islands, and Roberto Garcia, CEO of Triple S Salud and president of MAPA in Puerto Rico, and Maria Christie and Jacqueline Agramonte from the American Cancer Society in Puerto Rico. We are so grateful these individuals shared their time, expertise, and personal stories with us for today's event. First, we're gonna hear about the disparities faced by residents and the real challenges of delivering and accessing healthcare in the territories. Mi nombre es Jorge Rodríguez Ortiz, eh, soy casado, tengo dos hijos, pa eh, padre contento, eh, vivo en San Juan, Puerto Rico y soy técnico de aire acondicionado. En, en marzo de, de este año, del 2021, me fui a hacer una endoscopía eh, para un chequeo regular eh, y el, me hicieron una un estudio donde descubrieron eh, un linfoma folicular en grado 1, determinaron que necesitaba tratamiento de radioterapia. Ya me estaba quedando corto de dinero para pagar lo, los gastos de la casa, como el, la agua, la luz, teléfono. Medicaid is tremendously important because of the high rate of poverty in Puerto Rico. The islands per capita Income is half of that in Mississippi. Nearly half of our residents are covered by Medicaid, and half of Medicare enrollees here are dual eligible, so they are also covered by Medicaid. The high poverty rate means that we're dealing with many health disparities here as well. We have a higher disease burden than with things like hypertension and certain cancers, twice as many people with diabetes compared to the states. Many Puerto Ricans have left the island in search of jobs and better social support systems, including health care, leaving behind their parents. And as a result, we have a true epidemic of loneliness and social isolation among the elderly. We have seen a great amount of young people leave the island. Approximately 500,000 people have left the island in the last uh, past decade. Our physicians are leaving, our patients are getting old and sick, and we do need to have a permanent solution to our healthcare system. This has been a great challenge for us in Guam and the other territories because the hard truth is 
The disparity in the Medicaid funding we receive can mean the difference for so many families and whether they will have access to doctors, preventive screening, and cancer treatment. No sabía qué hacer. Entonces recorrí a la Organización Mundial del Cáncer en Puerto Rico, le expliqué la situación y ellos me recomendaron que solicitara el Medicaid. Cuando cogí este, el, el Medicaid, pues me sentí bien aliviado, como que una carga se me fue encima porque pude coger mis tratamientos, puedo seguir cogiendo mis tratamientos y estudios y, y es como una paz que uno recibe. Uh, being in, in the Virgin Islands, you have your pros and your cons, right? And um, we're the island paradise, yes. However, we're separated. The reason why we're the island paradise is because where we are. But we're separated from the contiguous United States and uh, with by many miles. And so uh, along with that comes with, one, the ability to maintain who we have within a territory from a provider standpoint. So our healthcare infrastructure can sometimes be a little challenging. And that is from two aspects. Right now, from a structural aspect, because of the hurricanes and, and um, some of the destruction, construction-wise, that we've seen at both our hospitals, more in St. Croix than on St. Thomas, but also from a provider aspect and being able to compete with providers, all levels of providers, clinicians within here and the mainland United States. My name is Patsy Daniel. I'm a mother of five and I live on the island of St. Croix here in the Virgin Islands. In 2016, I was diagnosed with stage three breast cancer. My treatment moved fast and I had two types of chemo and surgery and radiation. I traveled to Georgia to have my cancer treatment done and I had a great team of doctors, but I fell out of place there and was unhappy. Our Cancer Institute was damaged by Hurricanes Irma and Maria and has been closed since 2017. Due to the damage sustained to our facility, CKCI can no longer offer radiation oncology services on St. Thomas. Cancer patients in the U.S. Virgin Islands and the neighboring British Virgin Islands who require radiation oncology treatment must travel to Puerto Rico or to the U.S. mainland for care. It's hard for patients who are already dealing with the news of their diagnosis to have to leave their home, their island, and their support systems to seek care and to figure out how to support themselves and their families while they are away. I developed seizures from my treatment and I had anxiety attacks to the point where sometimes I couldn't walk. And uh, eventually I had to resign from doing my job. I was then able to, to get health coverage through MAP here in Ireland. Here at the Hope Lodge in San Juan, we provide services to all cancer patients in Puerto Rico and Virgin Islands. We also provide transportation to their cancer treatment centers. Medicaid is the only way many patients can access life-saving treatment. We constantly receive calls from patients who are very scared and anxious because they have been recently diagnosed and can't afford high cost treatment. Chemotherapy or tratamientos para cancer son tan caros que es imposible para una persona, un trabajador, padre y padre y dueño de familia poder costearlo por los altos costos del tratamiento. Eh, saber saber que en los estados cogen más fondos que en Puerto Rico, pues uno se siente incómodo porque aquí hace falta los fondos porque hay mucha gente que no tiene ni tan siquiera para pagar medicamentos. Inadequate and inequitable funding of Medicaid in the territories is not the only cause of disparities in cancer and other health outcomes, but the program has a significant role to play in helping to address these disparities and supporting health systems. As we mentioned earlier, in the states in DC, the federal government matches all Medicaid expenditures at the FMAP or federal matching rate, accounting for increased healthcare costs or increased enrollment in Medicaid. But in the US territories, 
the federal government only matches expenditures until the base block grant and supplemental funds are exhausted. So after that, there is no more funding for Medicaid, regardless of the need or changing circumstances. So program administrators have to cap enrollment, reduce reimbursements to providers, and restrict what treatment and services are covered by Medicaid. Let's hear about what that means for patients and providers. Mi nombre es Nieves Herrera. Eh, tengo 60 años de edad. Vivo en la isla de San Croix por 12 años. Y estoy diagnosticada de cáncer desde 2016. A partir de ahí, me vi la obligación de dejar voluntariamente mi trabajo para recibir la ayuda del Medicaid, del MP. Approximately 70% of our patients are covered by Medicare or Medicaid or are uninsured. Reimbursement by Medicare and Medicaid in the U.S. territories is different than in the continental United States, especially for things such as cancer care. We receive flat reimbursement rates, our reimbursements are capped, and there are limitations to our abilities to be reimbursed for some things. The reimbursements received for cancer care do not keep up with the increased cost of cancer care treatment or with the increased demand that we have seen. Entre el 2018 al 2019, eh, tuve metástasis de hueso, la cual he tenido varias complicaciones de pleura pulmonar, cáncer de hueso, Ahora el cáncer me ha topado en el nivel, en, la, en, el, en, los, en el hígado, la cual me ha beneficiado porque me ha permitido viajar a recibir tratamiento a Puerto Rico y también me pagan mis medicaciones y también cualquier acompañante que pueda ir conmigo, ellos le pagan el pasaje también, también el hospedaje si es necesario. In the past, of course, we had a 45, uh, a 55 45 match. And so, what that did is that it allowed us to only have a certain, we had a cap. So, it, don't, it only allowed us to bring in or accept application from a certain number of applicants. And the reason why is that the central government had to find that match, that 45% match. And what did it, what did that mean? If that if we did not have, we either owed the federal government money, or we were not allowed to um, enter in other individuals into an application process because we couldn't afford it. And so that's what we did for many many years. Mi nombre es María Lasalle, conocida por Mabel. Tengo 57 años, nacida en Aguadilla, Puerto Rico. El primero de febrero del 2020 fui diagnosticada con cáncer de seno. Mi primera impresión fue de mucho impacto porque nunca he tenido una condición degenerativa ni es, siempre he sido una persona saludable. In the last year alone, there were more than 43,000 individuals who were eligible for Medicaid, which exemplifies the upward trend of people eligible for Medicaid in the last 10 years. In the beginning of this pandemic, Medicaid supported one-fifth of Guam's population and our island processed more than 400,000 Medicaid claims in fiscal 2020 alone. Realmente, eh, en lo personal, tengo un gran agradecimiento a la Sociedad Americana del Cáncer porque el, el ser una guía, el ser una orientación, ese servicio de apoyo, de dirección, eh, es vital cuando las personas eh, están pasando prácticamente por una situación traumática y más que eso era una combinación del diagnóstico más la pandemia, lo que acrecentaba ¿verdad? Una, una incertidumbre. Eh, la Sociedad Americana del Cáncer facilita, dirige, guía de una manera eh, que uno se siente acompañado en ese proceso. HHS has recently announced an increase on our CAP funding, avoiding a fiscal cliff for September 30th, 2021. We continue striving to set our FMAP at a 76%, as well as additional funding to increase coverage to our population. Any reduction of funds will impact the actual range of services provided by the Government Health Plan, also known as Plan Vital. 
two thirds of the population is covered by Medicare or Medicaid. And these programs account for 80% of healthcare spending. That's a larger portion than in any other, any other state. And it means that these programs are hugely important to the health system. Physicians and other healthcare providers rely heavily on the Medicare and Medicaid programs for their livelihood. But it's a very unstable situation here for them and many healthcare professionals are leaving Puerto Rico as well. Medicaid has been severely underfunded for decades. Our per member per month rate is 60% lower than the average rate in the states. And the Medicare Advantage rate is 40% lower than the national average and 24% lower than in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Ahora mismo yo no estoy recibiendo tratamiento porque no lo han probado. Por eso que me gustaría que que sí que eh, como que el el plan médico el MP tuviera más ayuda para las islas para acá para las islas vírgenes y para otros lugares que también tengan este problema. Medicaid is absolutely critical to be able to cover almost half of our population which means 1.4 million people covered under the Medicaid insurance health plan. Without Medicaid, there's absolutely no way that Puerto Rico would be able to sustain a health system. Not only the Medicaid population would be affected, but also the privately run insurance. The whole system would collapse. Finally, before we move to the live Q&A discussion, we want to hear from people in the territories about the consequences of unstable, inadequate, and inequitable funding for the Medicaid program. We need to improve our program, not just maintain it. We need a permanent solution that not only continues current programs, but really allows us to improve and do better. With stable and equitable funding, we could have a healthier population better access to care, easier to retain healthcare providers. We would be able to address the needs of the population like long-term care. If we can address these healthcare problems in Puerto Rico, we would not have so many people buying one-way tickets to the mainland. Temporary Medicaid funding has been a big problem for us. We have had to go back to Washington and lobby and fight every couple of years to be able to sustain our health system. Our Medicaid program needs to be strengthened to be able to cover the needs of our population, especially our elder population. We have about 1.2 million people living with some kind of chronic disease. To build a healthier population, we need to be able to recruit and retain our healthcare providers and healthcare system workers. We have lost in the last five years about 14,000 healthcare workers, including 2,000 doctors that have left to the U.S. mainland because of insufficient reimbursement from insurance companies. There's no way that nonprofit organizations like the American Cancer Society would be able to provide the necessary funds to work with the uh, necessities of our uh, poor population. It's a matter of social justice. We. Puerto Ricans are U.S. citizens, and as any other U.S. citizens, we deserve to have a better healthcare system. As a result of the two hurricanes, uh, Category 5 hurricanes, we went into a, a disaster-related event, and the state of emergency began. And at that point in time, we were able to receive 100% Medicaid funding. I think 30,000 individuals we were able to add that to our Medicaid plan, which is wonderful. We need to be able to do that. We need to be treated as though we are, we are equal, as equal as um, many of the states. So look at what we can do from increasing overall territory-wide, circulating our funds, our dollars, if we are able to provide outpatient services and prevent the hospitalization and the illness. You have healthier, healthier individuals, and you have less admission to hospitals. We have a great team of excellent providers and caregivers who really care about our patients and who are exceptional and they provide very high quality care to our patients. So we're very proud of our staff and their commitment, even through this time where our facilities are compromised. Prior to the storms in 2017, we had a state of the art facility and we are currently working to build that back so we can resume providing comprehensive cancer care to persons in the U.S. Virgin Islands. With unstable and inadequate funding, 
Medicaid can't meet all the needs of the population. Medicaid has saved so many lives in Puerto Rico. For the millions of U.S. citizens living here, this is a matter of life or death. Independientemente del lugar donde nosotros vivimos, eh, necesitamos una, un trato justo, un trato digno. Eh, los puertorriqueños, igual que los americanos, tenemos las mismas condiciones, los mismos retos y necesitamos una cobertura digna, equitativa y que sea de justicia social. Que si no tuviéramos el Medicaid y el MP, ¿cómo va a sobrevivir un enfermo aquí? No solamente el paciente de cáncer, hay personas que hay muchas clases de diferentes de enfermedades, que el corazón, que hay que hacerle trasplantes del corazón a las personas y si no fuera por el, el MP, por el Medicaid, ¿a dónde fuéramos? Now we'll move into the discussion, moderated by Taylor Hall, Senior Regional Media Advocacy Man Manager for ACS CAN. Taylor? Thanks, Hillary. I'd like to welcome Roberto Garcia, CEO of Triple S Salud, and Maria Cristi, Vice President for Cancer Control with the American Cancer Society, who we heard from in the videos today. Bienvenidos. I'm also excited to be joined by Judy Solomon, a Senior Fellow with the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities as well as Stephanie Kenrich from ACS CAN's federal relations team. I have a few questions to get us started, but I encourage everyone to submit questions through the box that you'll find in the lower part of your screen. So to get us started, first question is for Stephanie. Stephanie, can you tell us about ACS CAN's work on this issue? Absolutely, I'm so happy to be here today. Um, so yeah, let me talk a little bit about how we are working on this issue. Um, ACS CAN has been actively engaged in working with Congress to avoid the fiscal cliff for Medicaid for the United States territories um, that's coming up today and finding a long-term solution for this life-saving health insurance program. For individuals facing a cancer diagnosis without access to quality, affordable health coverage, insurance coverage through Medicaid can really be the difference between life and death. Um, we've been really encouraged by the bipartisan support for extending funding for this program throughout the years and this year. And ACS CAN will continue to work with members of Congress to extend and ensure sustainable, equitable funding for this program. Um, it's so important. Um, for us to do this to reduce health disparities, especially cancer disparities, improve cancer outcomes, and really save more lives. Thanks so much for that update, Stephanie. Uh, next question is for Judy. Judy, can you tell us about CVPP and your perspective on Medicaid in the US territories? Sure, and thank you so much for having me today. And thanks so much to ACS CAN for all the work that you're doing on, on this. Um, the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities is a nonpartisan research and policy institute that works on federal and state policies to reduce poverty and inequality. So protecting Medicaid and uh, ensuring equitable access to health care in Puerto Rico and the other territories is a big part and very important to our work. Thanks so much, Judy, for sharing. Uh, this next question is for Maria. Uh, Maria, can you tell us more about the fragility of the healthcare system in Puerto Rico and what the shortage of providers means for patients on the island? Well, Taylor, as you have heard a little while ago in the videos, we have been losing doctors rapidly in the past few years. Uh, I just asked the president of the uh, Physicians Association last week, actually how many doctors we have left. He said the doctors have gone the numbers have gone from 16,000 a couple of years ago to 9,000 today. So as you can see, the uh, insufficient reimbursement for many uh, physicians have been the main reason for them to leave the island. There's no way that we can maintain a healthy uh, system if we don't have enough physicians. Right now, I was told that we have about 64 oncologists actively practicing on the island. And we know that there is a, a really dire need of uh, specialists, subspecialists, uh, for example, gynecology, oncologists, and things like that. And after the pandemic, uh, we have had a very hard time getting uh, 
spaces for the, uh, you know, for our patients to be treated by these decisions. Gracias, Maria. That really helps us give perspective um, on the scope of the problem on the island. Um, this next question is for Bobby. Bobby, gracias por estar aquí con nosotros. Uh, we heard a little bit in the videos, including from yourself, about what Medicaid could do with sustainable and adequate funding. Could you tell us more about what that could mean exactly? Well, thank you first again for having us here. Uh, well, it can really address the questions that have been raised right here in this uh, video. Uh, and bottom line is we need sustainable adequate funding to improve the health care of all the territories through additional benefits through investment certainty in long-term care uh, by helping us to retain providers especially those subspecialists and specialists that uh, maria crisi was referring to a moment ago so they're um, really basic things that need to be taken care of uh, for a program that as you heard is really a lifeline for our most vulnerable uh, citizens in their most vulnerable moments when they're diagnosed with catastrophic illnesses. Uh, so uh, a lot to do uh, and a lot that can be done with more adequate and sustainable funding. Thank you, Bobby. Um, next question is back to Judy. Judy, can you tell us why open-ended funding is so important and what's the problem with caps or block grant funding uh, for Medicaid in the territories or the states? Sure, and I think um, it might be helpful just to sort of uh, see where we are today, September 30th, which is the end of the, the federal fiscal year, and it was the date on which there would have been a, a major cliff because the last tranche of temporary uh, funding to the territories uh, would expire. Um, I think as alluded to, as, as Hillary mentioned, um, there's been a, a kind of reinterpretation of, of the last statutory change that gave um, additional funding. And as a result, the funding levels will be essentially equal to what they were last year. So they won't go down to the very, very low block grant allotments that um, would be catastrophic. But there hasn't been a change um, that affects the drop in the matching rate. So the matching rate it is 55%. And I think we're seeing today a temporary fix in that um, through the continuing resolution that is about to pass or may have actually passed already. But that still leaves us in the situation of uh, really needing to address uh, the, the fact that the structure is a block grant, that there are allotments, and that even if they are at this new higher level, uh, they're, they're not gonna cut it. They, you just can't overstate the importance of open-ended federal funding, which is what the states have. So when there is a, a hurricane, when there is a pandemic, when there is um, aging population and the needs increase, States can draw down federal funds uh, to the level of what they need, but that's not the case in the territories. With, the, with capped funding, it will not address um, those, those increased needs. And as um, healthcare costs go up, even with this new level of funding, it will soon be inadequate. Um, and it isn't adequate to do the things um, that were alluded to that need to be done to provide parity with state programs in terms of uh, aligning benefits, covering all the benefits that, that people get in the state. Um, the cliffs themselves really prevent progress because if you don't know that you're going to have the funding for a, a long while, for forever essentially, uh, there's a there's a concern about making improvements that you won't be able to sustain. So while it's critical right now to address the FMAP issue, which isn't resolved by the new interpretation, it's it's also critical to move to a solution that would permanently do away with the block grant and the inadequate statutory matching rate and provide open funding. Uh, that the territories need to meet the needs of their residents in the same ways as if they lived in the state. 
May I add, uh, Judy, to what you just said? I'd like to build on that, if I may. Uh, I think what you're raising is a really important point. And, and in Puerto Rico, we're, we're very grateful for uh, the new legal uh, position that the HHS has taken and uh, for the efforts of the administration. Uh, at the same time, we, we acknowledge that it, it's, it's just not going to do it in the long term, right? Maybe for this year, uh, for next year. Uh, it will maintain the program as we have it today, but the program today still has serious deficiencies. Uh, we only have uh, 10 out of 15 or nine out of 15 mandatory benefits in Puerto Rico because they're just as the funding levels that we need to sustain them. Likewise, there are other important uh, elements of the program that we don't have. Things as basic as non-medical emergency transportation or non-emergency non medical transportation rather, uh, diabetic materials for our uh, very large diabetic population, uh, nursing facilities, long-term care. These are the things that allow for the program to work over the long-term. And we really need those addressed because if you uh, simply extend the levels that were established originally temporarily, but now with the new interpretation of the law on a permanent basis, what you're doing is extending the program as is. And with a 2.7% inflation uh, for cost, medical costs that they're including in that uh, new legal position, it still doesn't cover the uh, historic trend of over 5%, 6% of medical cost inflation. So we're extending a program with that risk, but also we're not able to provide uh, a comprehensive health program, which is what our most vulnerable population needs. Thank you so much, Judy, for uh, the explanation and Roberto for those examples and just, you know, both of you stressing the importance of, you know, looking long term and what's sustainable in terms of funding and what's necessary. Um, this next question is for Stephanie. So Stephanie, we heard from the governor of Guam and the health commissioner in the U.S. Virgin Islands that provider shortages are a real problem. And I, Maria mentioned it earlier on as well. How does that impact cancer care and treatment? Oh, it absolutely has a big effect on cancer care and treatment. Um, folks who are able, better able to access providers have better access to cancer screenings and prevention and therefore timely treatment. Um, you know, I mean, we, it's been proven time and again that, you know, folks having access to early detention and screening of cancer, often their cancer is found earlier and therefore at that point it's more treatable and more survivable and when there's a shortage of providers people aren't going to have as much access to people to do their cancer screenings and it's critically important. Um, it's also important for being able to receive timely cancer care once you've been diagnosed um, and you know we've heard so many stories about having to go far away from home to get the treatment that they need. Um, and it's really, it's an, a really unacceptable barrier um, when it comes to accessing care. Um, you know, I think that, you know, as we're talking about all of this as well, I mean, as we look at, you know, some of the natural disasters that have happened in, in recent years, um, you know, I think, you know, there's, you know, as these things have happened, and as you know, we've seen hurricanes and other really devastating impacts. I mean, it's really kind of exacerbated a lot of the access to care issues um, that we've seen come from this provider shortage. So yeah, it's, it's a critically important issue. Yeah, thank you so much, Stephanie. And you know, to your point, we saw that in the patient stories that were shared today. Uh, just the many barriers and just how this has exasperated um, the inequalities that we've already seen in the territories. So uh, this next question is back to Maria. Uh, you talked about how ACS CAN cannot step into the government's role in providing medical care for people. Can you talk more about that and why we can't rely on nonprofits, churches, and charities to replace or supplement Medicaid? There's no way that uh, we can fill that gap even if we put all the financial assistance together that we are able to find for our patients, we would never be able to finance their treatments. Um, Puerto Rico has uh, over 16,000 newly diagnosed patient, cancer patients every year. And we have uh, uh, organizations like American Cancer Society in Puerto Rico and, and all the other ones have seen a very sharp decrease in their fundraising efforts 
since this uh, COVID pandemic started. So financially, it's not sustainable for us to be able to fill that gap. Uh, Medicaid uh, and the uncertainty and stability of funds hurts not only patients, but it hurts the providers and it, and it drives residents away from the island to find better treatments. And eventually it will cost more to have these patients be treated outside of the island. Uh, it is extremely important to have the support of the government locally and especially in Washington to achieve a permanent solution. Social justice and health equity for Puerto Rico and the territories, it's critical. So I just want to uh, thank you, uh, uh, American Cancer Society Action Cancer Network for putting this together and, and getting all of this information out there because it is, we are in a critical day today and we hope that we won't have to maintain this critical state uh, for much longer. No, thank you, Maria, for being here with us and for sharing this important perspective and for all you do every day. Um, with that, I'll pass it to uh, both Bobby and Judy. Uh, how do services covered by Medicaid and territories differ from Medicaid in the state? So I, I think, as, as you said, um, it, it's a number of the mandatory services that are required in the states are not covered in, in Puerto Rico, including care in nursing homes, home, some home health services, non-emergency medical transportation, essentially uh, transportation to places other than hospitals, um, doctor's offices and so on that many people need. Um, and also the full range of benefits for children that are required by something called the early and periodic screening diagnostic and treatment program that uh, requires that children get um, all the services they need, regardless of whether the state has chosen to cover that particular benefit for adults. Similarly, um, the other territories uh, are not totally aligned. In fact, uh, the Northern Mariana Islands and American Samoa have waiver authority that's that's in the statute, in the Medicaid, in the statute that allows um, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to waive any provisions of the statute. So they too don't have to uh, provide the benefits. But even without the waiver, the expectation has never been that the territories cover all the services that states cover because they just haven't had the funding. At the, with those block grants, and a match rate that's set at a level well below um, the level it would be in the states. No one expects them to cover that. And it really goes, I think, to your point, Robert, Roberto, on um, the, the need for funding that's adequate, that even with this new level, it's, it's still not gonna be enough to bring up to parity, uh, adding those benefits, paying providers the amount that you need to keep them in the program and so on. Without that, we're gonna continue at this sort of much lower level that just does not provide parity for people living in the territory. Unlike the states, uh, I can tell you Puerto Rico, and I'm not sure if it's true for the rest of the territories, is, is not required and does not offer what's called the Medicare Savings Program. And this program aids elderly Medicare beneficiaries in affording uh, in getting them affordable premiums uh, and cost sharing. So uh, that program really applies to the, the Medicare population that's also eligible for Medicaid, as we call them the dual population, right? And, and that's, a, that's a really uh, crucial um, element to help them with premiums. Um, and without it, it, it's very difficult for them to, to address the increasing uh, cost that come with, with um, reaching that age. So uh, that's just one more element that, that we need to address in this equation. Definitely, and thank you both so much for sharing. Um, so we actually had a question come in in the chat about the current status of bills that could help the situation. So uh, Judy and Stephanie, and um, I'll pass it to Stephanie first. Can you talk about the current situation of how this problem can, can fix? Sure. Um, well, 
we are in a, a really important time. And by the way, I'll start and Judy, please jump in because I'm actually, I'm sure everybody is on the panel is well, well aware of kind of the dynamics right now, but we are um, in a really interesting time on Capitol Hill right now. Um, as you know, I mean, this traditional or this fiscal cliff is coming up as part of the um, CR that or the continuing resolution that Congress is considering today. So that the language, I think we already talked about this, the language in the continuing resolution will just extend current funding levels for Puerto Rico through December 3rd. So that's that. Um, in addition, the folks on in the House um, in the Energy and Commerce Committee, both Democrats and Republicans came together on a, um, on a plan for um, extended funding for um, Puerto Rico and the other territories. Um, and they kind of have a bipartisan deal that they had considered in committee um, that they had kind of advanced, which is really a good sign that there are bipartisan conversations happening on this right now. So that's really good. Um, and we do anticipate, you know, folks coming together for a bipartisan long-term or longer term solution to this, um, you know, by the end of the year. And certainly since now we are, we're gonna have this December 3rd deadline um, to deal with the cliff. Um, and I know Judy had mentioned earlier that there's also this new issue of the Biden administration kind of reinterpreting current law in terms of whether a cliff should exist. Um, and there's a GAO report that's being requested um, to examine that decision by the administration. So, you know, we'll know more then. But yeah, so I'll, I can turn it over to Judy now. I don't know if there's anything that you wanted to add. Yeah, I just had one follow-up question to that. Um, how can people in the States help with this issue? Oh, uh, sure. Um, and then I'll do this really quickly and then turn it over to Judy for further information on the, uh, on the legislative situation such as it is. Um, listen, the most important thing you can do is get involved with organizations like ACS CAN that are advocating actively on this issue. And if you have Medicaid, um, if that's the coverage you have, share your story if you feel like it's benefited you. I mean, really the most powerful thing I feel like on Capitol Hill, you know, I'm a lobbyist. So like there, I'm a dime a dozen, but um, advocates who are able to kind of really go in and be like, you know, this is how this has affected me personally and talk to their members of Congress, you know, and say, you know, this is happening in and this is happening in the U.S. Virgin Islands, but you know it's not fair that they don't have the same access to this great coverage that I do and I benefit from in the state that I live in. So, um, making sure that you're, you know, that you're working with organizations that can help amplify your story, or that you're amplifying kind of other people's stories about how important Medicaid coverage really is to health and well-being. Like that is really the most important thing. Your voice is really powerful and you know, finding ways to kind of talk to your members of Congress about why this is so important is great. And organizations like ACS can kind of make that easier. So that's my advice. I don't have a whole lot to add on the, on, on the complicated uh, situation in Congress right now. Um, it's not, it, it was on, there was, as Stephanie said, we were on a path to a potential uh, bipartisan agreement on the funding level that would have provided five years of funding for Puerto Rico and seven years uh, for the other territories or maybe eight, I forgot now. Um, but all of that was thrown off by um, this new interpretation uh, that in the funding levels um, from, identical to the last two years. We have another question in the chat, uh, and this one's specifically for uh, Maria and Bobby, about the challenges of cancer care in Puerto Rico and the future. Um, what does the future of cancer care on the island look like? Is there hope for recruiting and retaining specialists, or will everyone have to seek care on the mainland? Well, I can start, and then uh, maybe Bobby can add. Uh, the 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 government here has been trying to retain their physicians. The first thing they have done is to give them, uh, there's a law to give them a tax break. I think that law right now it's being um, fought with a fiscal board. I'm not sure it's been extended as, you know, as the physicians needed or, or wanted to. That's one of the ways they think that they can retain or even bring back physicians from, uh, from the states right now. But until we get the proper reimbursement, 
uh, for physicians, something comparable to the states. Uh, you know, I think we'll still have those phys young physicians, especially not the older ones, but the young physicians that go to the states to get their fellowships and their trainings usually get some extremely good offers and they just don't come back. So we do need to have that uh, necessary funding to be able to provide uh, you know, sufficient uh, reimbursement for them. There's just no other way. And hospitals have to have the reimbursement they need to be able to make, uh, to fix their, their facilities and, and upgrade many of the, of the equipments they have for physicians to be, feel comfortable to practice here in Puerto Rico. I, I fully agree with what you're saying. Uh, and, I, and this is coming from uh, a managed care organization, right? That, that mm -hmm. we're the ones who uh, work uh, with physicians and we receive uh, funding from uh, CMS for Medicare and through uh, the Puerto Rico Health Insurance Administration for the Medicaid program. We fully agree. We need better reimbursement rate, better reimbursement rates if we want to retain our positions. Uh, and so, if I could take a step back and, and just tell you my perspective on why we got here, if you have, as I said in, in the video. Um, about 80% of the total funding in the system is in these two federal programs, Medicaid and Medicare. Of the $11 billion in premiums paid in Puerto Rico on an annual basis, 80% is in these two programs. That's the flip side, or the, you know, the opposite of what you see in the states, where it's mostly in the commercial uh, business. So as a result, the, um, the reliance for their livelihood of physicians, and not just physicians, healthcare workers generally, on these programs is disproportionate to what anyone in the U.S. is used to. Second, the cost in Puerto Rico is an island. I'm sure it's the same in the U.S. Virgin Islands and the other island territories. It's the same or higher than anywhere else. And yet in Puerto Rico, at least, we receive funding that's 60% lower than the average in the U.S. for Medicaid and 40% lower than the average, the, than the fee-for-service benchmark average in the United States. And when you look at the CPI, right, the, the consumer price index, inflation in essence, you break it down into the different elements. Most things are more expensive than in the States, you know, with one exception, healthcare. And when you have pharmacy costs, and Maya, you know this as well as anyone, that are just the same as in the rest of the nation. Cancer costs, right? The treatment of cancer is no less expensive from a pharma standpoint than it is in the rest of the, of the nation. And you have electricity costs that are higher than anywhere else in the nation and on and on where we end up, you know, where, where the, la, la soga parte por lo finito, right? The, the rope breaks at the, you know, at, at the weakest point. And that's in our provider community and our healthcare workers. And we need to work on that. I fully agree. Yeah, thank you both so much for painting the full picture there um, and just giving further perspective and reiterating the importance of adequate and sustainable funding. Um, and Judy, now we have you back. Uh, actually, this next question is for you that came in the chat. If funding caps were lifted, uh, would more people be eligible for insurance coverage through Medicaid? Uh, likely, yes. I mean, I think, um, the the Eligibility levels, we, did, we haven't mentioned this, but the eligibility levels in the territories um, are set at levels below most of the states, leaving aside the states that haven't expanded Medicaid and mostly in, in the South. Um, Puerto Rico recently increased its eligibility levels, uh, but they're still below the poverty line. Um, so, and I think um, in the video, uh, was mentioned in the Virgin Islands that when they did have the supplemental funding, they were able to bring more people in. So um, absolutely, yes, uh, they could align their programs with the eligibility levels in the states and cover more people. Thanks, Judy. Uh, and those were all the questions we had. And thank you guys so much for answering and giving your perspectives. Was there anything else that um, you'd like to add, just, just knowing that we've gone through the questions on the issue or what people can do? 
I can just really quickly just give a, an update on uh, that uh, Congress has now passed uh, the congressional or the continuing re resolution. So that is an official thing. Um, I was just told in the chat. Thank you, Hillary. So um, that's a real time update on what's happening with this. So um, we have averted uh, the cliff for now. And I guess we'll see what happens in December. But I uh, just wanted to let everyone know that. Yeah, great. Thanks so much for sharing this update that happened right when we're on the call <laughs> and for this event. Anyone else have any closing thoughts they'd like to share? Yeah, the only thing I would I would add is essentially if we're going from cliff to cliff, um, then we're never going to get where it needs to be because we'll never have the stability and the adequacy of funding uh, to reach parity and an equitable solution to um, health providing health care to people in the territories, to citizens in the territories. Yeah, thank you for that. It's so true. Um, and Maria, Bobby? I just want to add that I think it's clear after listening to our patients, which I'm very, uh, uh, very excited about the way they, they express themselves. Uh, there's no way that these patients can survive their cancer or, or get their treatment without this Medicaid funding. This, uh, the treatments are extremely expensive. And, and as you can see with the poverty level that we have in Puerto Rico, uh, there was just no way. So it's a matter of justice. We do need a permanent solution for our system to, to strengthen and for the country as itself, Puerto Rico's uh, financial situation to improve. You can't have a, a healthy uh, a healthy country if you don't have a healthy health system or healthy people. Yeah, very true. Yeah, that's right. Uh, a healthy population uh, contributes to a healthy economy, right? And uh, I think that we really need to work with the safe situation here on the ground. Uh, we, we can't be relying on sending uh, US citizens stateside for treatment. And certainly we don't wanna see root families uprooted from their communities because they have a situation like cancer uh, or any other catastrophic illness. We can resolve that here on the ground. All we're asking for is uh, 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 some level of parity or, or equity so that uh, these patients can have the, the treatment they deserve. Yeah, exactly. Um, so thank you all so much. Clearly lots of important questions to discuss about this timely topic. And just as a reminder, you can access the videos from today's events, as well as lots of other additional resources at medicaidcoversus.org slash territories. And thank you again, and muchísimas gracias to all of our speakers and storytellers for being part of this event. And to everyone who's joined us from all across the country on this very important discussion today, we hope everyone has a great day and take care.